Thank you, Janice, and thank you, Heather, and thank you, Marlene. This has really been fun, and Marlene is a real treasure. I hope she's watching here. Um, we had her on our radio show a couple of weeks ago, and we plugged this conference. So maybe some of you attended today because you heard her on our national radio show, Free Thought Radio. So uh, I feel a little bit like an imposter here because I used to be part of the problem. I used to be the one causing the trauma. And, um, and now that I've, I've escaped, and I'll tell you my story in a minute, um, I'm not what you might call a mental health expert. I'm, I don't have any training in psychology, and I don't have any real counseling. I thought I was an expert when I was a minister. I thought I knew everything. When you're ordained and when you're called by God, well, <clears throat> God will help you do everything. But um, <clears throat> uh, my, my one claim to being an expert on trauma is a song that I won't be able to play for you now because for something technical, I couldn't get it to play. But I remembered that back in the 1970s, I wrote a song called Going Through Trauma. It was a ch children's song for Joy Berry. I've worked with Joy Berry since 1971, and we're still working together. She's a children's author. She has a whole bunch of series on tough stuff and living skills for children. She sold, I don't know how many millions of books. And uh, we met when we were both associate pastors of the same church. She was the children's minister, and I was the music minister when I was just 21. Um, and um, we've got along just fine. And then since then, I left the ministry, and she also has left the ministry. She's also now an agnostic, secular humanist, and so it's a great story. And even the wife of that church, the wife of the pastor of that church also left the ministry years later, Sally Cummins, and we just reconnected, said, you too? So with the three of us at that same church, we left um, eventually totally different paths. But uh, Joy had a whole bunch of series on trauma, uh, divorce and death and moving and all these things for kids. And she had uh, a general song called Going Through Trauma. And maybe it's good that I didn't play it for you today because it's a really hokey cliche 70s kind of rock and roll song um I'll, I'll i'll post it to one of one of the links that you can listen to it later so that's my claim to be an an expert in in trauma i was raised in an extreme authoritarian fundamentalist religion my parents were just devout born-again christians however i loved it I just, I was, I was totally thrilled. I was born into the right family and in, in the right religion, in the right country, in the right time of history. And I didn't feel like special or anything. I just thought, wow, how lucky. I just felt really lucky. And even though my parents were, you know, extreme fundamentalists, Bible literalists, creationists, and all of that, um, they were good and happy people, and we, we didn't have a dysfunctional childhood. Your whole life isn't about church. We, I mean, we lived our lives, and we just enjoyed And My mom was pretty fun and silly, and my dad was a police officer and a trombone player. Uh, in fact, before dad found religion, he was a, a, a pretty successful musician in the 1940s. And you can see my dad on some old movies. If you look at that old movie called Easter Parade with Judy Garland and, and Fred Astaire, uh, the Irving Berlin movie, you can see my dad playing the trombone when Judy Garland comes over and puts her hand on him and he looks up. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really a cute scene. You should look it up. It's the first song she sings in the movie. Well, he he abandoned all of the, the music business. He threw away all of his Glenn Miller records. He said no more worldly music and he, he got born again and they're starting to raise these three little boys. I was the oldest. And he just totally dedicated his life and his music and everything to Christianity. And we went to church uh, twice on Sunday. We went to church every Wednesday night prayer meeting. And uh, even to this day, on Wednesday nights, there's a little part of my brain says, oh, shouldn't, we be, shouldn't I be going somewhere? No, you know, the habits of being raised religious. <clears throat> and uh, it's, I, I think it's a testament to my family. I know not all families are the same. I've heard some horror stories from people. I think it's a testament to my parents' character <clears throat> that um, a little after I announced that I was leaving the ministry and became an atheist, about a year after that, my mom said, yeah, me too. 
I should have known, you know, Danny makes sense. And about a year after that, my dad also, he said, oh yeah, okay, he threw in the towel. So they were both happy atheists after that for many, many years, many decades. They died um, since then. But <clears throat> so, um, you know, we believed in hell and we believed in the second coming. And I, I remember being a little afraid as a kid, like, oh no, you know, what happened? Was it, what if I, there's a hell and there's a devil and, there, and we believed in demons and all that stuff. We believed in demon possession. Uh, we were even involved with the Pentecostals for a while, the Assemblies of God. Uh, Anaheim uh, Assembly of God became um, uh, Melody Land Christian Center in the middle of the charismatic movement. Pastor Ralph Wilkerson became a big deal, became sort of a hub for charismatics. We spoke in tongues and we did faith healing. And we, uh, you know, I was never like slain in the spirit or anything, but I'd spoke in tongues and sang in the spirit and... For me, it was a joy. For me, it was like a privilege. I, I really believed it, and I felt it, and I got the goosebumps, and and uh, I I received what I was convinced was a calling. And so, um, I I guess there was just this feeling of love and belonging to this community that was just so so special and so precious. I went to a, a, a Christian liberal arts college, Azusa, Azusa Pacific. Um, it's a university now, it was Azusa Pacific College. And I graduated, I got a degree in religion and I took a bunch of classes in in the Bible, in the Book of Romans and in Hebrew poetic literature and all, and how to preach a sermon. Maybe I took a class in psychology, um, maybe not, I don't even remember. Uh, but uh, when I became ordained to the ministry, there was a church in Central California ordained me to the ministry. Uh, then I figured, well, God's called me and the world's going to end any minute here. And so I made a better preach the gospel. I thought I knew everything. I thought, you know, I mean, if God calls you to do something, then there's nothing that's impossible. All things work together for good, the Bible says. So I remember when I was an associate pastor at churches, I did, um, you know, I did some things that I'm embarrassed about now. I remember, uh, I don't know, there was some woman, middle-aged woman who had problems in her marriage. And I don't remember it exactly, but I was the pastor on the staff. And so I was to counsel. What did I know about that? But I thought, well, God is God and and God's word is going to answer all problems. And and I'm pretty sure I told this woman, well, marry, uh, marriage is sacred and you need to stay with your husband. You need to stay with him because otherwise it's an affront to God and God will solve all problems. I'm pretty sure I said that and I'm, I'm totally embarrassed that I would even pretend that I could give advice. Who knows what kind of a marriage she was in? I don't, I don't really know. She confessed that she was having serious problems and I think my answer was flip and I think it was like, you know, God will take care of it all. And, um, and I felt good about what I said at the time. Now I cringe. I also remember once, um, um, one of the deacons of this church where I was an associate pastor, he went to the hospital with some serious heart problem. It was pretty bad. And so, uh, <laughs> so I went to, with the, the, the main pastor, we went to, to give a call to him and I was convinced he was going to die. <laughs> and so I gave, I, I gave what, what amounts to a kind of an informal last rites to this guy, like, well, you know, everybody's life comes to an end and you're prepared to live in heaven, you know. <laughs> and that was the wrong thing to say to somebody in the hospital, I now know. Um, I, I, you know, I wasn't that informed. A couple of weeks later, he came back to church and I don't think he ever spoke to me again. Uh, <laughs> he, I was giving him a death warrant. But uh, so, I, I mean, that shows you I was really more of a, um, like an evangelist. I wasn't, I didn't consider myself to be a, a local church pastoral person. I did it in three different churches, but I felt my calling was to go out on the road and preach and sing and do the songs and write the music. And I became a missionary to Mexico. I spent eight years in cross country evangelism, traveling from church to church. And uh, I, uh, I, I, then I wrote some musical, Christian musicals, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a bunch of Christian music with manna music and with word word music and with gospel light publication. And um, in fact, I'm still getting royalties. Even today, I'm still getting royalties, which is pretty funny. Um, 
and and I, I give them to a good cause. And so the um, Gospel Light, if you, some of you know Gospel Light Publications. They, they're now out of business, but for years they were the main producer of, of Sunday School and VBS curriculum, Bible, Vacation Bible School curriculum in California. And so I wrote three of their many musicals, and I think I was pretty good at it. I, I was a good craftsman, and I gave them what they wanted, but I think they hired me because I was fast and I was cheap. You know, I could work on a on a bottom line and I could get the work done. And we did, on one session, we did 117 songs in one week. We went into the studio and recorded 117 songs. I mean, that was a marathon. But in any event, um, those skills came in useful later. But there was a woman at Gospel Light uh, named Marion Wiggins who came into the studio and we were discussing and planning all this. Uh, a few years ago, I heard from Marion Wiggins she is now out of the ministry and out of gospel. She's now an atheist too. So, and we've had her on our radio show. And that was pretty fun to see that history. So I had, I was confident that I had all these answers and I wasn't eager to leave the faith. I, I, a lot of star, I guess everybody's different. We all have different psychologies. We all have different families. We have different theologies that we've come through. And I do sympathize with people who went through horrible trauma. I know it's happened. And, and I think, in my case, there was trauma leaving the ministry. And so I'm going to embarrass myself again. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in any of this stuff. And you, you experts can correct me later, okay, Marlene and some of the others. But I view it in my life only as four levels of trauma. And in order of the worst to the least, uh, intellectual trauma to me the cognitive dissonance, the, um, the, the problems of morality, the problems of meaning in life, or the problems of truth, uh, the problems of epistemology, those were really a hard struggle for me intellectually to wrap my brain and to change all of that. All the while I was praying in the Spirit and, and talking to Jesus and getting the goosebumps and and feeling like God was my best friend and that he was giving me directions and he talked to me. But the other part of my brain was going, well, wait a minute, is this true? So if there is such a thing as intellectual trauma, maybe, maybe there is, maybe there isn't, uh, that was horrible. That took me four or five years to really struggle through that, to rebuild who I was as a person, to, to basically jettison faith and to embrace reason and the scientific method and and observation and facts, basically a fact-based way of thinking. That was hard. That was tough. I don't think it was scarring. I think it was like just a hard way to grow up. Number two on my list, I would call emotional trauma. And uh, and by the way, my remedy for number one was just reading, reading books. There was no internet. I just got books. And in fact, one of the books I read was written by Annie Laurie Gaylor. Uh, and I wrote her a letter, and uh, if you've read my book, Godless, you know that uh, she didn't answer the letter, but she told Oprah Winfrey about me. And so I flew to Chicago to be on Oprah Winfrey show, and that's where I met Annie Laurie Gaylor, the author of one of these books I read. And a long story short, we got we later got married, and we're still married. So that's kind of neat. And you can see that show, by the way, if you Google Oprah Barker, Maybe you, you can look for it. It's online. You can see that show. The very first time that I publicly spoke about my atheism was on on live TV in front of a live audience. That was that was really weird. So anyway, books helped me. Uh, the second one was the emotional trauma for me, and and it wasn't as as bad. Uh, I remember feeling like, wow. So what I'm doing here is like spitting on my grandmother. I'm like betraying my culture. I'm like. I'm like telling all of my relatives and friends that they are they are wrong, and that I don't want to be that kind of a person. It was uh, th there was um, you know there was some of that feeling of of disappointment, a feeling of shame, a feeling of embarrassment, and then a feeling of responsibility towards my friends and, and people that I really admire that, that we're still friends today. Even people I really respect, I remember these feelings of like. Um, um, I'm, I'm letting down our friendship. And that, that was, that was kind of harmful. 
Of course, when I sent my letter out to everybody after I left the ministry, I learned really quick who were the, my true friends. And I think many of you have the same experience. This is a great way to test your friendships. Because if your friendship is conditional or contingent on something outside of you, you belong to the same club, the same group, you belong to the same community, you're all in the same marching parade. If that's, if that's what your con friendship is conditioned on, and if that disappears, what's the friendship? Is there anything there in the beginning? This is a great way to test it. And I did learn that some of those friends that I had back then, we truly were not vertical type friends. We were horizontal friends. We truly admired each other and respect each other for who we are, not because we're in the same club. So, but a lot of those friends disappeared. They were gone. They couldn't take it. Mark Griffo, for example, who was a young teenager whom I encouraged to go into the ministry. In spite of his father's objection, I said, well, don't listen to your earthly father. Listen to your heavenly father. If God's calling you, Mark Griffo is still in the ministry today. And uh, he sent me uh, a really ugly letter. He and his new wife, after I left the ministry, uh, and I said, wow, I guess we weren't really friends at all. It was, it was contingent, a contingent friendship or whatever the psychologist would call that because you're, you're acquaintances and you think you're friends, but you're not really. So, um, so the emotional part was pretty much handled. The remedy for me was pretty much through, through science and thinking about, well, my brain is just a biological mam mammalian brain and I can handle these things and I can work and I can break habits and and I can apologize and I can do my best to mend these these broken relationships if that's even possible. Number three on my list, I guess you would call maybe um, social, uh, this, you know, the social bonds, which I've already kind of talked about. My uncle Keith was a really good friend. He had been an alcoholic and Jesus had, had saved him from alcohol, basically. He went to AA, but, but really it was Jesus and God, and, and his alcoholism was horrible. It cost him his marriage, it cost him his house. We became good friends, Keith and I, and we worked together in the same computer programming after I left the ministry. Uh, and when he got my letter, that was it. We were no longer friends. And I was like, wait a minute, we, were, we had so much in common. And my grandfather... Uh, is an American Indian, and you know he he taught us some of the Indian songs and some he did some of the bead work and uh, and he was very special to us. My grandfather had told a bunch of stories about his childhood on Indian territory, <clears throat> and um, so Grandma and I collected those stories and we put them into a book called Paradise Remembered. He had a happy childhood growing up in Indian territory, and so. Um, I sent a copy to Uncle Keith because that's his dad. Uncle Keith's dad wrote these stories. And he mailed it back to me with a nasty note about, I don't want any part of anything to do with you. And I, and I said, well, it's not me. It's your dad's writings. And he still didn't want anything to do with it. And about a year later, he died of, of cancer. And I, I feel like that was, a, you know, that was tough. I mean, I wouldn't put it really high on the trauma list. I would put it on a scale of one to 10, maybe three or four, something like that. It was like just you know, losing that connection there. Uh, luckily, my mom and dad, it didn't have to happen with them. My brother, Daryl, as soon as I left the ministry, my brother, Daryl, he said, yeah, I feel the same way too. <laughs> Daryl was always a, um, I always thought Daryl was kind of a lousy Christian in the first place. And Daryl even admits, we're in the same family and he went, he loved it all, but he even admits that his whole attitude to Christianity was different from mine. His whole attitude was exactly how much sin can I commit and still get into heaven? And I thought his foot was way over that line and way too much. But anyway, so when I, when I came out as an atheist and I left the ministry, it gave him permission. His older brother was saying these things and he said, yeah, I've been thinking those things too. That's true. Yeah, yeah. So then he, he quickly embraced humanism and then later atheism. And today he's still very active. Uh, he, he has been the, um, the uh, president of our chapter in the state of Washington uh, in, in southern Washington for a while. And so, uh, but we do have one brother, Tom. He's a great guy. And Tom, the, the three of us boys, Tom's in the middle. And... Uh, He's, Tom's still a born-again Christian. He's still a churchgoer. He's still very conservative. But we get along fine. And, and it's because we're, we're family. 
And even Tom knows that there are more important things than what divides you. So I think I'm pretty lucky. I think my family has been a good, and, and to Tom's credit, uh, he hated, he hates Trump. He hated, he didn't vote for Trump. He was one of those 15% of evangelicals who did not vote for Trump. And so we had a lot to talk about, you can imagine. So that was what I might call social trauma. And then at the very bottom of the list, I would put it maybe even at zero, uh, compared to what other people feel. At the very bottom, my fourth um, trauma is what you might call, what I call biological or physical trauma. You know, like having panic attacks or um, anxiety or, or sleeplessness or, you know what I mean? That kind of a thing. And, and I've heard people say that, well, well Alice, who's going to be talking next, Alice uh, Gretchen, it, you know, talks about just the physical side of that kind of trauma. And for me, there was none of that. And I think maybe, you know, I took it so seriously and I was confident in my decisions and I went through this process of thinking it through. And for me, I think, and yeah, maybe this is true for everybody, um, a great therapy is just breathing, slow, deep breathing. And then long walks. Long walks are great therapy for me, not just for the physical exercise, but for the thinking. And, and you know, I'm working on another book now uh, called The End of Worship and thinking, I have to get out and think and then, oh yeah, I can put these ideas together. So for me, the remedy of anything biological, anxiety or stress in my life is breathing and then and music. I'm a professional musician and I get to play the piano. I, I have the greatest hobby. I get to go out and hang out with these friends, musicians, and we play music. We have a great time. People applaud, and we just really are having a blast. And then I come home with a check. How many hobbies make money for you? So I was kind of neat. And music, for me at least, music has been just a great way. And I think many people will say in their lives, music is a, um, you know, a therapeutic. Uh, although I have to say that sometimes when I hear some of the hymns, I do kind of have a kind of a flashback. Some of the hymns that I just don't want to hear anymore, even though I might admit the music is beautiful, those words, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins that I used to sing with gusto. And I now think, oh gosh, I was singing those songs. And like Marlene said earlier, um, Amazing Grace, uh, that for such a wretch as I, you know, the, a lot of the hymns are putting down humans in order to glorify and magnify the God. And to this day, I know the music to Amazing, Amazing Grace is pretty. It's just a pentatonic scale. But to me, it's it's manipulative and, and it's a kind of a, like coercive, let's be spiritual kind of, and I just can't really listen to that music. Maybe that's just me. So is that trauma? I don't know if that's trauma or, or not. but. Um, so, um, and then of course my big, big therapy, my big relief from going through all of that, of course, is having something to work for, something to do, a meaning uh, in life. I wrote a book called Life Driven Purpose in which I say there is no purpose of life. There is no meaning of life. And it's a good thing there's not. If there were a purpose of life, we would be subservient. We would be underneath this whoever or whatever's handing us our marching orders, like a military, you know, like a uh, military leader saying, here's your, here's your orders right now. But to say there's no meaning or purpose of life is not to say there's no meaning or purpose in life. And there's plenty of meaning in life, which we don't find it. We don't, we create it. We make it ourselves. And for me, working with the Freedom From Religion Foundation is uh, that, that special meaning, be, being able to work to keep state and church separate, uh, and now even to have some lobbyists. And in fact, just yesterday we had a meeting uh, uh, to prepare for a meeting we're having on Friday with the Office of Faith-Based, what is it called? Faith-Based and Neighborhood Initiative. They're finally inviting us to the table. Uh, and so to be able to work for these causes and educate the public about non-theism, that's great meaning in my life. Now, speaking of music, I'm going to end by uh, playing a song that I wrote pretty early, I think it was 1991 or 92, if I can figure out how to do this now. We, uh, Janice and Heather helped me through it, so I'm going to share the screen. I'm going to play the song, uh, which I think touches on just about everything I've said. It's called Life is Good. And then after that, we can tape some questions. And this is me on the piano, and this is my song, and this is, this is, these are my words, and this is what I feel about life today.
This song is for those people who were raised with religion, who had quite a struggle breaking free, who have learned that life as an unbeliever is unbelievably good. monkey is off my back I'm thinking for myself and I am back on track and I can tell you life is good they used to tell me that I was condemned to be punished for eternity but not to be sad I should be glad because Jesus has set me free then I started thinking Pardon me, but something here is terribly wrong. It makes me happier to learn that I don't need to be forgiven. I was innocent all along. Life is good. Life is good. Life is unbelievably good. Superstitious monkey is off of my back I'm thinking for myself and I am back on track And I can tell you Life is good How can I be free if I must die to myself To be a slave to a dictator's will How can I be happy if I think that my friends And my loved ones will end up in hell can I be glad when I am always afraid that I haven't measured up like I should? The day that I abandon all of the above is when I truly learn that life is good. Life is good. Life is good. Life is good. Superstitious monkey is off of my back I'm thinking for myself and I am back on track And I can tell you Life is good Giving up religion was a real smart move From the ridiculous to the sublime Living a life of learning and love And laughter is certainly no crime what a great feeling to be finally free Not needing a master or lord Every breath that I breathe belongs to me And life is its own reward Life is good Life is good Life is unbelievably good The superstitious monkey is off of my back I think it for myself and I am back on track And I can tell you Oh, let me tell you I will tell you That life is good Is it life good? was marvelous dan you can really tickle those ivories <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna redo that song um because i always envisioned it with a choir you know and a, a real band that was just me and an organ uh and we're working on a project called uh, godless gospel with some real former gospel musicians mostly southern black musicians who have left the ministry they're now atheists and agnostics we're putting together a show and, and that'll include that song with real singers you know i mean i'm i can cut it but with really good singers so that watch, sounds fun watch for that <laughs> we have some questions for you if you think you're ready for some questions because i have all the answers <laughs> <laughs> well you know i've been told <laughs> okay let's see um 
Do you have any additional perspectives about clergy or elders elders offering emotional care to uh, non-religious trauma to people, especially with severe non-religious trauma, basically asserting themselves as social workers or therapists, like clergy uh, that are declaring basically that they are social workers or therapists. What are your thoughts on that? Well, some of them are. There are some clergy who are trained. They're good, trained in psychology and counseling, and some of them have degrees in it. I know that. Uh, I don't think most of them do. I certainly, I didn't know anybody like that. We, we were trained in the Bible. Uh, and then a, a problem comes in with chaplains. We were just talking today on co coffee and conversation with two of our attorneys who deal with religion and healthcare. Mm. Um, that a lot of people don't want the chaplain coming in. You know, and so they're the, a lot of these chaplains are just like local ministers. Maybe they have some classes in that, but um, you know, I guess I guess I would say uh, check their credentials, mm -hmm. um, find out if they're the real thing, and if all you want is some emotional support, well, then you know, maybe maybe there's nothing wrong with some stranger coming into your hospital room and holding your hand. I don't know. I wouldn't want that. In fact, there was a study in Florida where 4% of people in the hospital said they wanted uh, a, a chaplain to come in. Most of them wanted their own minister, their own rabbi, mm -hmm. you know, because it's their family, right? And only 4% said they would actually welcome that person. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think you'll have to ask somebody with more credentials than, than me about... Uh, you know, the right kind of people to do that kind of counseling. And we know that there are humanist um, chaplains as well, which I'm quite yeah. pleased to see the rise uh, in that group. Um, we have another question for you. Um, Megan says, I remember being told that many of the disciples of Jesus Christ became martyrs for him after his death and that they wouldn't have been willing to give up their lives claiming that Jesus rose from the dead if he really didn't. Can you speak on this subject at all? I remember certainly hearing that as an argument as well for why I should believe. Yeah, so um I forget the author. There's a great book book out on martyrs um, that came out about three or four years ago. It's at the office, um, showing that a lot of these martyr stories are exaggerations. And mm. it, these stories of martyrs actually were told by the church many, many years later about it. And of course, people have become martyrs for their faiths in all religions. Uh, think about the um, the Buddhist monk who killed himself in protesting the Vietnam War. Does that mean Buddhism is true because they were willing to give up their life? Mm. So just because you're a martyr doesn't necessarily mean your faith is true. Your facts are true. It means that your faith is strong. Huh. And, uh, you know, there are, you know, you, know, you th think about the mother who kills herself and her children so they can all go to heaven. Mm -hmm. Do we praise that? We think maybe there's a mental problem there, you right. know, with people who would want to become martyrs. Mm -hmm. uh, but except for... Stephen in the New Testament might be the only real case that we might think of who became a martyr. Mm -hmm. After that, those are just anecdotal stories that we don't really have any true evidence for. Mm -hmm. And of course, martyrdom became a big deal in the or in the second century and third century mm -hmm. um, because it was seems that then even then it was seen that's that's a proof of our faith because look at all these martyrs. Well, right, name two, you know. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, interesting answer. Thank you. Joni says, my question is, um, what event triggered you from turning Christian to atheist, if you feel comfortable discussing that? Was it an, a single event? So, no, it was not. And um, you can read the whole story in my book, Godless. Um, it was a process. It was like four or five year process of intellectual restructuring little by little and most of those four or five years happened within the faith so we all know there's a huge continuum of christian theologies we were way over here on the on the right side of fundamentalist literalist bible believing all that but there are christians that are more moderate and they're more liberal and so for me, it was a process of migrating within Christianity. Mm. And after a couple of years, I became more of a moderate where I, I preached less about hell 
uh, and the afterlife. And I preached more about love and how do you live this life, which is what you hear in a lot of Sunday morning sermons, right? So I went through a migration within the faith of becoming more liberal uh, until eventually I swing all the way across that spectrum. And what I like to say is that I dumped out all the bathwater and I found out, hey, there's no baby there, you know? <laughs> right. um, but um, but if, if, if I had to pick one thing, like early on, uh, it would be uh, Adam and Eve. I thought Adam and Eve were historical people because the Bible says it. But I met a pastor. When I was an evangelist, I met hundreds of pastors. And, you know, we would meet before the meeting, and we would pray for God's blessing on the service, and then I would go out and preach and, and sometimes play my piano and stuff. And the pastor said, there's some people in my church who don't think Adam and Eve were real people. They think that was a metaphor. And I thought, what? And you let them be members of your church? How can you do that? And he said, well, don't get me wrong. I think they were real, but these people think that the Bible's filled with metaphor. Like when Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son, was there really a prodigal son, a real person with an address? It didn't matter. Jesus or whoever wrote that story made up a story, and what mattered was the moral import. What mattered to the story wasn't the historicity of it, but it was a story to make a point. So just like Jesus could make up stories to make a point, well, the ancient Israelites made up stories too about the origin of our species and our life. And then and, and Adam and Eve was one of their stories that they didn't even think people were going to take literally back mm -hmm. then. They mm -hmm. thought it was just one of those mythical stories. And so I got to thinking, well, after, after four or five years of thinking like that, well, the Bible, you know, well, maybe, you know, okay, prodigal son and Adam and Eve, okay, I can go with that. Uh, uh, but then what else in the Bible besides that? Maybe Yahweh is just a metaphor. What other characters? Maybe God himself is just one of these big figures of speech. And that's where I dumped out all the bathwater and, hey, what's there? You know, so mm -hmm. that's an oversimplification, but that kind of that kind of points to how my brain was working back then. Uh, yeah, I know for me, um, the power of myth, myth was really popular with um, by Joseph Campbell, Campbell um, Joseph helping Campbell. me to see things uh, in a in a very different light from the way that I'd been raised to believe them as true. Um, we do have another question. As a musician, now do you find more joy in music than when you were writing Christian music? Well, no and yes. I mean, for me, music was an outward expression of my feelings, and it was joyful then. Um, I was just looking at, I have some old copies here of music that was published back then. Jesus is Coming Again was one of them, and and I have one called Hey Old Jonah, and they're, <laughs> lyrically, they're really silly. I mean, I'm embarrassed, but at the time, it was just my joy. It was just what I wanted to do. And today, in the last 30 years, I've been really getting into jazz, and so I just love playing in jazz combos. I just, you know, all the standards, the Gershwin and Cole Porter and Irving Berlin and Yip Harburg and, um, you know, uh, Jerome Kern, and... Uh, getting together with a band to play and just playing p solo piano. I, I play at a country club. Well, I had until the pandemic. I think they're going to start back up again. And so it's just as joyful, I think, because it's still me expressing what I find beautiful in life. And uh, it's, it's, it's to live for it. You know, it's, it's something, it's a, when, when we're playing in the band with a good band, if Johnny Whitta comes on the bass and we've got John, John Lombardo on the drum, if we have a really good band, who are people who are listening and jamming and thinking and improvising, then there are some moments that are almost transcendent. It's almost mm -hmm. like the song becomes something bigger than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. And we look at each other like, whoa, this is like mystical. It's like, and we know it isn't. We know because we're all not, we don't believe in some mystical, but there's this illusion of like goosebumps and wow, this is amazing. And we all we all love that moment, but we don't pretend like it's pointing to anything outside of our brains. It's right. something human and real. And so, so yeah, I, I think it's 
maybe a little bit more fun because I don't have to pretend with the lyrics anymore. That's right. That's right. Um, I I also really appreciated the point you made about the difference between people talking about the meaning of life versus the meaning in life. I, I think that is such a fantastic um, distinction and something that's really important and potentially quite helpful to people because that can trip a lot of people up when they lose their faith or walk away from their faith or whatever it is. And then they're struggling thinking, well, now what's the meaning or I don't have a purpose or. So you can read my book. Uh, I have a whole book about that. And I think you will understand the title. It's called life driven purpose. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of purpose driven life. I love Some it. You got it right. Right. <laughs> I'm turning it upside down. Instead of life being top, top down, life is bottom up. It's, it's a life-driven purpose, not this way, like from a king or a dictator. We do it. Mm -hmm. Yes, We're, we have a few minutes left. Um, one person has asked, did it ever bother you to think of people going to hell when you were a Christian? Was that something that really um, troubled you or it was just kind of on the periphery? Yeah, that's why I became an evangelist. I spent mm -hmm. eight years trying to save people from hell. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to go back in my brain and remember how literal was I? I mean, I believed the Bible, and so it, it, hell had to be true. But really, how literal was I? I think I might have had some nightmares as a kid or something. But uh, in any event, whatever it was, whether it was actual torture or just separation from God, which was bad enough, whatever it was, it's not good. And so people needed to be saved. And so I was happy that Jesus delayed his second coming one more day so that I could preach one more sermon to get one more person out of hell into heaven. Wow. Yep. I remember. I remember that life. <laughs> um, I'm also really looking forward to you moderating the ex-clergy panel that is going to be happening on Sunday. And that'll be with uh, Clint Haycock and Tim Sledge and uh, Dave Hayward, uh, all of whom were ministers like yeah. you and, and all of whom believed very firmly. Um, and then you find yourself on the other side of the church or on the outside of the church. And uh, it can sure be a painful transition for people yeah. who were clergy or missionaries. Yeah. The clergy project now has more than a thousand, almost 1100 members in it since That's amazing. 10 years ago. It was Mar March of uh, uh, 2011 that it started. And they're from all different backgrounds, not just Christian. Yeah. It's mostly Christian. Uh, it's, it's international. There are some imams in the group um, and uh, some others, some rabbis, former, uh, former rabbis in the group, but they're mostly Christians of different persuasions, uh, different denominations. And so our screening committee, our screeners, uh, if somebody contacts us who is a Southern Baptist, for example, well, then um, we have a Southern, John Compeer, who's a fifth generation Southern Baptist minister. He can talk to them because he knows their language. He can say, so what was your theology? And he can tell that they're the real thing. Mm -hmm. If it's a Pentecostal, then we give somebody else, you know, uh, yeah. you may, another one to talk to them. Because we can't just let anybody in the group. We have That's to make right. sure they really were clergy and they mm -hmm. really have left. So Right, right. Wow. Well, if um, people want to find out some more about the Clergy Project or uh, Freedom From Religion Foundation, they can visit our exhibit hall and find out out more there or connect with you that way and we are out of time for this session thank you dan thanks so much for sharing with us that i did enjoy your song so much and thanks everyone mm -hmm.